And one day, my sister comes over, she says, you know, I'm so upset that you're so locked away here, and I think I have got a job for you, which I'll be able to let you know tomorrow. So I was really very happy that I'd be able to go out and help to bring some more food in. Because, you see, the most important commodity was the food, the bread. Everything what you were doing, everything was focused on that, because the starvation was so horrendous. So, did tomorrow come? And I walked over to the window. She used to come about 7 o'clock in the evening. And that happened on this 14th of September, 1939, 1942, beg your pardon. <coughs> and um, she walked over to the window, and she was waiting, wait. so I was waiting, and I hadn't seen anyone coming. And all of a sudden I heard some shots and said, your power, just throw me away from the window. And I shook my head and I said to myself, what is it? And I walked towards the window and I heard more shots and more. And then silence. So I was rather disappointed that she hasn't come yet, but I thought there must be transports because that was their usual procedure. The transport arriving in the night or during the day they used to segregate him and shot him there and there. So I walked over to my mother and I said, you know, there must be a delay. That's why she didn't come yet, because there must have been a transport. And we have walking, working and so on. And then all of a sudden, a group of girls came in. And they were shushing with other girls in the corners. And as I approached them, they stopped talking. Then another group of girls came in. And, um, and then I approached them. And they said, so I said, please, could you tell me what happened outside? Or they said, no, no, nothing, nothing. But I said, look, what, have, what are those shots? Would you please tell me what happened? They said, yes, there were 55 men and one girl. They had to undress and dig their own grave. And then I realized that was my sister amongst them. And to tell that news to my mother was rather very difficult. We, then we had to carry wood for the bodies to be burned because the Germans didn't want to leave any trace. So can you imagine for a mother to know that this is her child uh, and she's carrying the wood for the bodies to be burned. And as for myself, she always used to sleep on my left side on my arm. And from that night onwards until today, I always feel such a chill, like something torn away from me. So it was very, very upsetting how to cope with that. It was we, the tears we shared that night, we could have filled buckets full of. My other sister Helen was working in Schindler's factory on a night shift, and during the day she was kidnapped on the way to her living quarters and taken into the hospital for experiments. They injected her with petrol and draw out her blood. It seems unbelievable to you, but that was true. And the nurse, which I knew very well, when I wanted to see her, I wasn't allowed. And slowly, slowly, she, I lost her as well. They were shouting at us, the Nazis, quick, we have to march. And we marched again to villages, to cities, and we found ourselves in Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, we were segregated by Dr. Mengele. As you maybe read about him, he was uh, the one who tortured and experimented on people. And we were segregated to a shower. Some of the women, and my mother and myself, 
and we walked down and some steps and we got into that place stone floors, openings in the ceiling we were shivering, we had to leave our clothes behind and then um, no soap was given to us and we were waiting and waiting trembling, it was bitter cold and all of a sudden the doors opened on my left and walked in a woman which I recognized she was the clerk working in a previous camp. I stood on my toes and I thought, oh, I would like to for, to speak to her. And, um, and it's so many women in front, it was difficult. And I stood and she oh, she says, ah, and she noticed me, she stretched her arms and she said, ah, you are here. And then she rushed out, and I was rather disappointed I wasn't able to speak to her. But then water came through, and we showered ourselves, and we drank it because we were so thirsty. And we came out of there when the water stopped. The women embraced us who worked there, and they shouted, You are wonderful, you are alive. We thought we'd never see you again. You came out of the fire. I looked around. I said, what are you talking about? And they were you know, embracing us. They were so happy to see us. I said, what are you talking about? They said, don't you know where you've been? I said, no, where? You were in a guest chamber. When I heard that, I completely, utterly lost my voice. Nothing, nothing came through. No saliva, nothing. And I tell you, until took a few minutes until I st start speaking. And at that point, I felt must be power over powers that God must have saved my life, and so many others were with me. I get emotional. <laughs> I have received the MB by Her Majesty the Queen for the work which I do. I lecture at universities, colleges, schools, learn, teach them, I'm given lessons about uh, the Holocaust. They should never be forgotten and they should never forget and teach their own children and children to come. And of course it's very rewarding for me because enormous amount of letters. I've got boxes full of letters from the children, how much I hope them and how much they appreciate their life now. The feedback is tremendous, which is, gives me a lot of comfort. And I feel it is my duty, as long as I can, to broaden the people's horizon and to learn about it. And the Holocaust Day should be always observed. So as long as I can, and I do hope they will light a candle long after me.